Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 12th Century Fiction where we are reading uh, James Joyce's novel Ulysses. So we are beginning to wind up with this novel now uh, because obviously in terms of the, the entire novel it is impossible to cover it for the purpose of this course but what we are looking at essentially is certain selected sections for the purpose of our examination but also how that connects to some of the broader concerns, some of the broader thematic concerns we talked about while looking at modernism and 20th century literature the way we are studying here in this particular course. Now, we will just skip into page 1022 in this particular version which should be on the screen and this is a conversation that Leopold Bloom has with a sailor inside, uh, inside a shop, a, a pub uh, or a coffee shop, you know, it's, you know, it's not very really clear what the shop is but you know, it is a space where people come and go to talk about different things, they read newspapers, they drink, they have small petty sometimes meaningless conversations, uh, so it is a very liminal kind of a space where Bloom encounters a sailor and obviously the figure of the sailor is important because as we all know this novel there is a very interesting um, retelling of the Homer's, the Homeric uh, Odysseus which is entirely about sailing, it is entirely about coming back home, it is entirely about sailors who lose directions. So the presence of the sailor is a very symbolic presence in this particular section because what it does essentially is again it connects the mythical narrative with the uh, modern narrative. So this is part of Joyce's mythic method which you talked about already in terms of how he uses certain characters and tropes and situations which connect to more mythical uh, conditions. Okay, so this should be on the screen and this conversation is something which we will look at in some details. Uh, there ensued a somewhat lengthy pause. One man was reading at fits and starts a stained uh, by coffee evening journal, stained by coffee evening journal, another card with the natives shore day another seaman's dis discharge. Mr. Bloom, so far as he was personally concerned, was just pondering in a pensive mood. So, pensive becomes a very important mood in Ulysses where uh, Bloom and Did Didalus, both of them are reflecting on different things without really saying much. He vividly recollected when the occurrence alluded to took, took place as well as yesterday, roughly some score of years previously in the days of the land troubles when it took the civilized world by storm, figuratively speaking early in the 80s. Uh, 81 to be correct when he was just turned 15. So again the whole idea of the Irish reform struggles uh, which are very political issues are connected to micro uh, temporal conditions when Bloom had himself turned 15. And recollection or memory in Ulysses is a very sensory effective neural experience existential as well. But also it is interesting how that keeps connecting to more political phenomena, uh, more political events, more political narratives in that sense. I boss, the sailor broke in, give us back them papers. So, sailor breaks in and he wants the papers back. The request having com complied with, he clawed them up with a scrape. Have you seen the rock of Gibraltar? Mr. Bloom inquired. The sailor grimaced, chewing in a way that might be read as yes, I or no. Ah, you have touched there too, Mr. Bloom said. You are up a point, thinking he had, in the hope that a rover might possibly buy some reminiscences but he failed to do so by simply letting spirit, letting spurt a jew or a jealous pew into the sawdust and shook his head with a sort of uh, lazy scorn. What would that be about? Mrs. Mr. B interrogated. Can you recall the boats? Our soy distant sailor munched heavily uh, a while hungrily before answering. I am tired of all the rocks in the sea, he said and boats and ships, salt junk all the time. So, you have the uh, presence of a very, very tired or saturated sailor and this idea of saturation becomes important. You become too full with the substance, you become too full with um, you know, certain kind of materials which drown you. In the case of Bloom and Dallas, they are full of memories, they are full of uh, different kinds of time which begin to drown them. So, you know, the whole idea of becoming full is very much part of the embodiment in Ulysses so, and, and where you become full and it obviously makes you immobile, it makes you um, you know innovated. So, sail over here is an example of one such full figure, one such innovated figure. Tired seemingly, he ceased. His questioner perceiving that he was not likely to get a great deal of change out of such a wily old customer felt the wool, wool gathering on the enormous dimensions of the water about the globe. Suffice it to say that as a casual glance uh, at the map revealed, it covered fully three-fourths of it and fully realized accordingly what it meant to rule the waves.
right? So again, the whole idea of the romantic idea of the sea, the romantic uh, geographical idea of the sea has been this massive uh, water body which covered most of the earth and this becomes a haunt uh, loop of Bloom's imagination. Whereas on the other hand, we have the, uh, an actual sailor who has been to different parts of the world, to different parts of the sea, is actually tired of the sea. Once one person wants to get out of the sea, the other person wants to romantically engage with the sea. So again, the whole idea of getting in and, uh, and engaging and then on the other hand, getting out and being innovative is part of the liminality uh, notion and Ulysses. So it is very liminal storytelling, getting in and getting out and often simultaneous activity. So these two dimensions are important. The one dimension is the romantic dimension, uh, Bloom wanted to get to the sea and obviously this connects uh, interestingly with the original tale of Ulysses and the other is actually the figure of the sailor once who is one person who has actually been in the sea but wants to get out of the sea because it saturated him with salt and it sort of essentially drowned him. Okay. On more than one occasion, a dozen at the lowest, near the north bull at Dolly Mount, he had remarked a superannuated old salt, evidently derelict, uh, seated habitually near the north, particularly redolent sea on the wall, staring quite uh, obliviously at it and it at him, dreaming of fresh woods and pastures new as someone somewhere rings, and it left him wondering why. So again, the whole idea of a series of tired sailors becomes important in Ulysses because Tiredness in sea, uh, seafaring becomes a very important bit in the Homeric tale as well, getting tired in the sea. So this idea of a series, looking at a series of very tired sailors who are looking at the sea, who are staring back at them, which is staring back at them becomes a very interesting image, a very moving uh, visual image in Ulysses. Uh, so he's, he's always wondered why they are so tired, he's always wondered why uh, they look so oblivious and so memoryless, the sailors. Uh, possibly he had tried to find out the secret for himself, floundering up and down the antipodes and all that sort of thing and over and under, well not exactly under, uh, tempting the face. And the old sweat twenty to nil, there was really no secret about it at all. Nevertheless, without getting into the minute of the business, the eloquent fact remained the sea was there in all its glory and in the natural course of things somebody or other had to sail on it and fly in the face of providence, though it merely went to show how people usually contrive to load some sort of onus onto the other fellow like the hell idea and the lottery and the insurance, which are run on identically in the same lines, so that for the very reasons, if no the lifeboat Sunday was a highly laudable institution to which the public at large, no matter where living inland or uh, seaside as the case might be, having it brought home to them like that should extend its gratitude also to the harbour masters and coast guard service who had to man the rigging and push off and out amid the elements, whatever the reason, whatever the season when duty called Ireland expects that every man and so on and sometimes had a terrible time of it in the winter time not forgetting the Irish lights. Kish and others liable to capsize in any moment, rounding which he once with his daughter had experienced some remarkably choppy, not to say stormy weather. So we have this huge sentence as you can see, it just goes on for almost 10 lines. But what has been said is interesting, we have on the other hand uh, the insurance agents, the advertisements, the petty people like Bloom himself and on the other hand we have this very brave and tired sailors, Irish sailors and these two uh, sections of people are juxtaposed with each other and Bloom's imagination over here. So whereas the inland activities are like petty activities and different things happening uh, which keeps the machinery of economy going, the machinery of sociality going etc. The outland activities outside the land and you know, outward activities of the sailors, they are the ones which according to Bloom bring real glory in modern times. There was a fellow sailed with me in the rover, the old sea dog himself a rover, uh, proceeded, uh, went ashore uh, and took up a tough job as gentleman's valet at six quid a month. So again, the whole transition becomes interesting. This old sailor is beginning to speak now and he says there was an old sailor, an old fellow with me who sailed a rover and then he subsequently became a gentleman's valet at six quid a month. So the transition from being this rough, uh, you know, seafaring sailor to a gentleman's valet becomes very much a, a social rise in some estimation. Them are his trousers uh, on me and he gave me an old skin and that jack knife. So he's essentially wearing the same trousers as that sailor had worn once upon a time. I'm game for the job, shaving and brush up. I hate roaming about. He, there's my son now, Danny, run off to sea and his mother got him took in a drapers and cock where he could easily, uh, he could be drawing easy money. 
Uh, so again, the whole idea of making money uh, and being um, a different kind of person than a sailor is remarked upon over here. And a sailor obviously turns out to be a very cynical, exhausted, emptied out person uh, who is emptied out as well as drowned with time, drowned with water, drowned with sea. And he's envying, his gaze is in, uh, interesting over here, a very envious gaze on people who have good money making jobs, uh, people who make money by being valet of some gentleman uh, working in a bank which is supposedly easy money. Okay, what age is he? Quarried one hero, who by the way, uh, seen from the aside, the side bore a direct resemblance to Henry Campbell, the town clerk, away from the carking cares of the office, unwashed of course, and in a seedy get up and a strong suspicion of nose paint about the nasal appendage. So again, it's very random conversations and Ulysses are interesting because these in some sense are reminiscent of the conversations that happen in the Greek choruses or in the, you know, in the other choral characters in uh, Greek tragedies. So you have this seemingly unimportant man coming together in a social space such as this, a pub, and then having this random conversations inquiring about people's uh, uh, relatives and family, which in turn gives us in, in readers information about these people's backgrounds. Okay. Uh, why? The sailor answered with a slow, puzzled utterance. My son, Danny, he'll be about 18 now. Why? I figure it. Uh, the skipperine father hereupon uh, tore upon his grey or unclean anyhow shirt with his two hands and scratched away at his chest, on which there was to be seen an image tattooed in blue Chinese ink intended to represent an anchor. So again, the whole idea of tattoo becomes important because you know the tattoo becomes a bodily inscription over here, which gives him a sense of a seafaring identity and this tattoo in Chinese, uh, which is intended to represent an anchor. Right, so this becomes a very interesting image. The tattoo of an anchor is obviously meant uh, to uh, identify him as a sailor, but at the same time, it's an anchor which is supposedly to anchor him down. There was lice in the bunk in Bridgewater, uh, he remarked, sure as nuts. I must get a wash tomorrow and next day. Is them bad lads, I objects to. I hate those buggers. Suck your blood dry, they does. Seeing that they were all looking at his chest, he accommodatingly dragged his shirt mere open so that on top of the time honored symbol of the mariner's hope and rest, they had a full view of the figure of sixteen and a young man's side face, looking frowningly rather. Tattoo, the exhibitor explained, there was done when he were lying becalmed off Odyssea in a black sea under Captain Dalton, fellow the name of Antonio, done that. There he is himself a Greek. Did it hurt much doing it? And once uh, one asked, uh, one asked the sailor. That worthy, however, was busily engaged in collecting round there, somewhere in this squeezing arm. See here, he said, showing Antonio. There he is cursing the maid, and there he is now. He added, the same fellow pulling the skin with his fingers, some special knack evidently, and a laughing at a yam. In this point of face, a young man named Antonio's livid face uh, did actually look like four smiling and the curious effects excited the unreserved uh, admiration of everybody including Skin the Goat who this time scratched over. So again the tattoo maker is so present over here and the whole idea of tattoo becomes important because on the one hand tattoo becomes an inscription of an identity but also becomes a marker of pain. In other words the tattoo represents very interestingly over here how to arrive at a certain identity especially the seafaring identity you must be able to pass through pain you know the pain of separation, the, you know, the fear of constant death, the pain of not making enough money etc. Okay, uh, need bit of work one long showman said and what is the number four? Loaf of number two queried. Eaten alive, a third asked a sailor. Aye, aye, sighed again the latter personage, more cheeringly this time with some sort of a half smile for a brief duration only in the direction of the question about the number eight. A Greek he was. And then he added with rather gallows bird humor, considering his alish end, as bad as old Antonio, for he left me on my oneum. The face of a streetwalker glazed and haggard under a black straw hat appeared askew around the door of the shelter palpably reconnecting on her own with the object of bringing more grist uh, to, her to her mill. Mr. Bloom, scarcely knowing which way to look, turned around, turned away on the moment, uh, flustered, but outwardly calm, and picking up from the table the pink sheet of the Abbey Street organ which, he, uh, which the Javi, if such he was, had laid aside, he picked it up and looked at the pink of the paper through the white pink. So again, uh, the whole idea of uh, the sensory experience of color becomes important because what Bloom wants to do away, he wants to distract himself, he wants to be disconnected from the situation that is emerging immediately. So he tries to look at a pink piece of paper and wonders, uh, he looking at a pink, the why is a pink in the first place, the very idea of the 
uh, you know, the occurrence of colors. His reason for doing so doing was he recognized on the moment around the door the same face he had caught a fleeting glimpse of that afternoon at Olmont Quay, the partially idiotic female, namely of the lady who knew the lady in the brown costume does be with yours, Mrs. B, and begged the chance of his washing. Also, why washing would seem rather vague than not your washing. Uh, still candor compelled him to admit that he had washed his wife undergarments when soiled in Holy Street, and woman uh, would and did to a man similar uh, garments initialed with Bowie and Draper's marking ink. Hers was that is, uh, hers word that is. If they really loved him, that is to say, love me, love my dirty shirt. Still, j just then, bringing on the tenter hooks and desired the females to be more than a company, so it came as a genuine relief when the keeper made re made a rude sign to take herself own. Rounding the side of the evening telegraph, he just caught a fleeting glimpse of a face around the side of the door when a kind of uh, demented glossy grin showing that she was not exactly at, or she was not exactly all there viewing with evident amusement the group of gazers around skipper's murphy's skipper murphy's nautical chest and then there was no more of her and again this idea this presence of this very interesting woman becomes important because the whole idea the whole representation is done very cinematically bloom looks at her to the corner of his eyes and as he moves away he gets a sigh of relief and then there's a glass reflection of her moving away which makes it more visual and quality okay now we have this conversation with bloom and uh, de dallas which becomes interesting again to a certain very sensory markers Yet still, though his eyes were thick, would sleep and see, air life was full of a host of things and coincidences of a terrible nature, and was quite within the bounds of possibility. There was not an entire fabrication, though at first blush, there was not much uh, inherent probability in all this proof he got off his chest, being strictly a curate gospel. He had been meantime taken stock of the individual in front of him, and Sherlock Holmes saying him, again, look at the verb over here, Sherlock Holmes saying him, uh, which is obviously said uh, to him, trying to figure out things about him, etc. Uh, ever since he clapped his uh, clapped eyes on him, uh, though a well-preserved man of no little stamina, if a trifle prone to baldness, there was something curious or spurious in the cut of his jib that suggested a jail delivery and required no violent stretch of imagination to associate such a weird-looking specimen with the oakum and treadmill fraternity. He might even have done for his uh, man supposing it was his own case, he told, as people often did about others, namely that he killed him for himself and has served his four or five good-looking years in dur endurance, vile to say anything of the Antonio presence. No duration, no relation to the dramatic personage of identical name who sprang from the pen of a national poet who expiated the, 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 the crimes of this melancholic manner above described. On the other hand, he might be only bluffing, a pardonable weakness because meeting un unmistakable marks, Dublin residents like those Jarvis waiting news from abroad would tempt any ancient manner who sailed the ocean seas to draw the long bow about the schooner, Hesperus and etc. And when all that was said and done, there lies a fellow told about himself couldn't possibly hold a proverbial candle to the whole, uh, wholesale whoopers other fellows coined about him. So, the whole idea of bluffing becomes important away. The whole idea of not living up to certain identities become important away. Yeah. And again, I mean, if you connect it to the idea of the sailor, the idea of some, someone who sails in the sea, the very act of sailing, um, it entails an engagement with fluidity. And that fluidity becomes part of the information creating, information consumption mechanism in your list. and your The identities become very, very fluid in quality. Okay. Okay. Now, we come to the final bit of this episode, which we talk about some details before winding up. Well, Mr. B uh, proceeds to stipulate in this conversation, you must look at both sides of the question. It is hard to lay down any hard and fast rules as to right and wrong, but room for improvement all around. There certainly is, though every country, they say, our own distressful uh, included, has a government it deserves. So again, this is a very political um, section of Ulysses, and among the many uh, conversations Ulysses operates or generates, we have some very key political questions which keep coming up. But with a little goodwill all around, and it's all very fine to boast of mutual superiority, but what about mutual equality? I resent violence and intolerance in any shape or form. It never reaches anything or stops anything. A revolution must come from the due installments plan. It's a patent absurdity on the face of it to hate people because they live around the corner and speak another vernacular in the next house, so to speak. <coughs> so the whole idea of xenophobia and racism becomes important over here because we've seen already at the very beginning of Ulysses, we have this Englishman and the Irish pitted against each other and the difference is mapped out the level of accent, the level of language use, etc. 
memorable bloody bridge battle and seven minutes war, Stephen asserted, uh, assented uh, between Skinner's Alley and Ormond Market. Yes, Mr. Bloom thoughtfully, uh, thoroughly agreed, entirely endorsing the remark that was overwhelming, overwhelmingly right, and the whole world was full of that sort of thing, right? So the whole idea of ambivalence becomes important over here, and Mr. Bloom believes, begins to believe in ambivalence, begins to believe in this blurring of bottle between right and wrong, and he thinks that the whole world is full of that sort of thing. So the world of ambivalence is articulated over here, which also makes Ulysses a very grey novel in the sense of you don't quite know how to map out the good people from the bad people, the vulgar people and the sophisticated people, the erotic people and non-erotic people, and the cheaters and the honest people. They all merge together in different combinations across this very moving and mappable metropolis. So I'll stop at this point today. We'll continue with this and hopefully begin to wind up in the next couple of lectures. Thank you for your attention.